I asked Marilyn to be playing that when I came up. They're on a draw a contrast, okay? You know the words of song? Silent night, holy night, all is calm, all is bright, right? Not. It was not calm and it was not bright. Thank you, Marilyn, for helping me with that. Just think of it. The first Christmas was riddled with a whole lot of surprises. And the surprises weren't the kind of, oh boy, good, a surprise. It's like, are you, are you kidding me? Oh no. And this, this is a story that is riddled with conflict. There were relationships that were strained. I mean, every time an angel would show up, you know what he had to say? Chill out. <laughs> yeah, I mean, these guys were scary. And uh, this was not a story that everything was calm and bright. There were some real scary things that happened. During, just think of it. There was a mean king. They had to navigate that. And then, oh my goodness, you know, these, uh, these shepherds out in the field, they weren't standing there waiting for that angel. I mean, they were like freaked out when he showed up. And then it wasn't only one, but then all his friends showed up. And they said, what in the world is going on? And then they said, remember how it ended up? We've got to go to town and see what this is all about. There was a whole lot of confusion here. It was real scary. There was darkness. There was fear. I mean, this was not all calm and bright. This morning when I got here, I saw Frank, and I said, Hey, Frank, how's it going? And he started shaking his head. I thought, Uh-oh, i got a story coming here. He said, Everything is falling apart. I said, Sounds like Christmas. <laughs> he said, You know, we had everything so well planned, and we have our schedule, the concert set for next Friday. It's going to work out perfectly, and the school kids are going to come, and their choir was going to sing with us. And then the the parade got rained out and they changed it and now it's right on top of our same date and then even the uh the choir that's going to sing well they have to sing at the christmas tree lighting ceremony so that's not going to happen but then this morning it's changed again sounds like christmas to me that's what the first christmas was like this morning other news that i got just a little old text from dennis i won't be there today and i get here and we get the rest of the story he's in the hospital he was supposed to be the one leading the prayer this morning. That's not the kind of surprise you're waiting for, is it? And then, you know, the news with Daryl. Man, we're all praying for Daryl. And that's not how we picture this silent night, holy night, all is calm, all is bright Christmas. No, it's got that kind of stuff in it too. But you know what? All of that's real. All of that's real. And just like Frank, read from right here when we were lighting the Advent candles, promise kept. You know, there were surprises that these folks encountered in this story, and that it was not because there hadn't been a plan, and God was just trying to come up with the roll it with the flow and come up with the plan at the last minute. No, last week, remember what Jesse said? Isaiah wrote 700 years before about the events that were going to take place. And you know what took place? The events took place. Were there surprises along the way? There sure were. When, in Matthew, when you go and read, you know, if you're like me, my first year as a, my faith is my own believer, born again believer, I was a junior in college, 1974. And I thought, I want to read the Christmas story for myself the first time. I turned to Matthew, looking for the Christmas, you know, the baby born in a barn story. And I looked at Matthew. Have you looked at Matthew 1 lately? It's the begats. Forty-two generations of weird people's names. And that was not a baby born in a born story, barn story. And I was, well, I was disappointed. I can't even find the Christmas story. But what did the begats tell us? God's been playing this thing a long time. Forty-two generations. And the promise was kept. And then when you get to John, I, well, you know, I couldn't find it in Matthew, so then I went to Mark. And you know what Mark's called, the Gospel of Mark's called? The narrative of omission. Know what that means? He left it out. He left the Christmas story out. I couldn't find it in Mark either. Well, I quit, kept, well, let's see. Four guys told their story. Let's, see, let's try the next one, Luke. No, it's about this elderly priest with a weird name. And that's not a baby born in a barn story either. And I couldn't even find it. And I was, I was really disappointed. 
And you know, doesn't Christmas have some disappointments along the way? Yeah, because we have this picture. You know, we thank you, Billy, decorating. So it's the first thing I saw when I drove up this morning. All these fantastic decorations. And, and uh, you know what that says, too? We're getting ready. You know, we're anticipating, too. Then you go to John. How does John start his gospel? The same first three words that are in Genesis, where the Bible starts, in the beginning. And so when I couldn't find the Christmas story, what I was really doing is I was seeing the Christmas story. All of those document that there was a promise made and a promise kept. And there were ups and downs along the way, and there were some real scary times. We're going to read about one of those this morning. In fact, I don't know what your image of Mary is, but I may mess it up this morning. <laughs> but, you know, Christmas time, and we're all decorating. I dragged the Christmas tree in last night for Kelly. Hopefully, by the time I get home, it'll all be done. That's the way we like to do it, right, Gino? Yeah. But, uh, you know, we'll be, Kelly will be, that's that royal we, Kelly will be doing the decorating. Got saw a friend this week, uh, her name is Bethany, and she posted, hey, I'm getting all my Christmas decorations out, and she posted that right there, and she said, for 11 years I've been hanging this, what is that called, needlepoint? Is that what that is? Okay, it's what? That. <laughs> and uh, she said, I've been hanging this up for 11 years, and until this year I didn't even notice. Look at it. Mary Christmas. <laughs> and, you know, isn't that, though, the way we, we have this picture in our mind about how it's going to be, and we just look through it all. And I even have done that with the Bible when I've read the Christmas story. Uh, I've, I've, I've had this picture in my mind. And so my mind's picture overtakes even when I'm reading the words. But for the next four weeks, we're going to look at some things about Christmas that you may have missed all these times because there are surprises here along the way. Take the manger scene, just that by itself. And we got a prettier one right here in front of us. I, I, as a little bitty kid, doesn't everybody relate to this? Weren't you just enamored by the, the nativity scenes? And Kelly has a bunch of them, I don't know, eight or ten she always puts up in our house. And I like them when they look just like this. Everybody's here. You know, that's one of the things about Christmas, isn't it? You know, yesterday we had, we had our family, my father's side of the family, gathering up, way up in northeast Texas. And one of the main things, we were all here together. We wanted everybody here. And just think of it. You know Christmas parties included gatherings of hookers, did you? Yeah. <laughs> We had a whole bunch of hookers all in the same room <laughs> yesterday. It, it was exciting. But we, we like it when everybody's together, don't we? Look at these manger scenes. We like, first of all, of course, we want Jesus to be right there in the middle. And then we want Mary and Joseph to be there. And we don't want to dare leave out the shepherds. You know, they're my favorite characters. So here the shepherds are. And then the wise men, we can't leave them out. And they come on camels, we all suppose. And, and, and then, of course, the angel. And they're all there together, right? They were not. The, they weren't all there together. This is a story that took weeks to unfold. And all of those people were not there together all at the same time. There's a lot of surprises about this Christmas story. And this week, as I was preparing, really trying to look ahead to the next weeks as well. But this week in particular, we're going to see some surprises in this story. If you will turn with me, in case you find, can't find the Christmas story like I couldn't, let's go to Luke 1, and we'll see some of the backstory to the Christmas story, you know, the baby born in a barn part. But we're going to see the first installment. And for the next weeks, we're going to look at Christmas from four different perspectives. Today, Mary's perspective. Next week, Joseph's perspective. The next week, then we'll get to the shepherds, their perspective. And the last week, the uh, wise men's perspective. And we're going to look at this story. We're going to look at it up close. And uh, maybe you, like me, will see some surprise, surprises along the way. You know, I have in your bulletin, we're going to start in verse 5, but we're not going to read that story. I wanted to include it because that's really where it starts. It's part of the back story. That's the story about, you know, the elderly Jewish priest who, what we would call, drew straws. They did this. It was their tradition to see which of the priests would represent all the people and go into the Holy of Holies 
part in the temple. That was behind that big veil, you know, the one that was torn from top to bottom when Jesus was crucified. Well, this man, Zachariah, elderly man, he was the one picked, you know, by the, by the draw of the straw. And uh, you know how they even did that? That place was so holy, and it was a scary place to them. In fact, before the priest would go behind the curtain, they would tie a rope to his ankle. And he would walk in there dragging this rope. He's dragging the rope in there. Any ideas why they tied a rope to his ankle? You beat me to it. Yeah, if he were to die while he was back there burning incense, they didn't want to go back there and get, you know, lightning struck or anything. They could drag him out. And that was like when my grandmother used to take us kids fishing. She couldn't swim. She would tie a rope around our waist and to a tree. That way if we fell in, she knew she could drag us out. Well, there's, that's, that's how the Christmas story, you know, Zachariah, elderly priest, walking in, dragging a rope behind him. And that's the back story. Now, we're not going to read that part of the story. We're going to reference it a few times. But we're going to read the story about Mary. And this may have a few surprises for you like it did for me. So what we're going to actually start, we're going to start on verse 26 of Luke chapter 1. And here we go. It was in six months. Six months of what? Six months after that uh, when Zechariah went behind that curtain and this angel appeared to him. Six months after that happened. See how this story was planned out. And the promise is being kept to the minutest of details. So in the sixth month, uh, God sent an angel, Gabriel, same angel that showed up in the, earlier in this very same chapter to Zechariah. And uh, in the town of Galilee to a virgin, that's an important word, isn't it? Pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. Let's talk a little bit about marriage, first century. Jewish marriage in the first century. You know, marriage was a contract, not between a man and a woman, but between two families. And see, they were in what we would call an engagement period, but for them it was the contract period. And here's how it would have begun. Joseph's father and Mary's father most likely would have arranged this wedding, and they actually entered into contract. Each family committing itself to the other. It wasn't a commitment between two people, it was a commitment between two families. They were in the contract period, something very similar to what we would call engagement. And uh, during that time they were making preparations, mostly Joseph would have been saving up to pay the rest of what we would call a dowry. Because see, when Mary was to get married, she would leave the home, and then she would leave the part of the household responsibilities that she had been keeping unkept. And so uh, her family needed to be compensated, even literally for the loss of income, because their daughter was leaving. And then the daughter would leave the home, go to the home of the groom's family, and there, I know this sounds kind of weird, they would consummate the marriage, contract, consummation, and then they had to have a celebration. And then they would have the big party, and everybody was invited. And it was at a party like that that Jesus performed his first miracle, turned water into wine. And us Baptists still kind of have a problem about that, don't we? But that was the, the marriage process. They were in the contract stage. And so they were not living together. And uh, they were in, in an engagement period, and all the community was watching. In fact, there's some extra special me measures taken to make sure that the purity of their relationship was maintained. Okay, back to the story. The virgin's name was Mary. Now this angel went to her and said, I can just imagine this angel. Same one, Gabriel. He had already gone to Zechariah. And uh, he, you know what it's like to walk into a room and there's somebody in there and you know they don't know you're there. And, you know, sometimes it's like, and I'm going to get you. <laughs> and we love startling them. You, do you like that? Am I the only demented one in the room? <laughs> Kelly hates it when I do that. And I know she does, but I still do it. You know, I'm participating in the fall. But uh, so this angel Gabriel appears, you know, behind the curtain 
with Zechariah. Nobody else is supposed to be there. And so he's doing his thing. I guess he's trying to get the incense lit or something. And the angel says the same thing. He said, man, I don't want to startle this guy. But what did it do? It freaked him out. In fact, have you been startled so badly that you couldn't even talk? Well, that's what happened to him. For nine months, <laughs> he couldn't talk. And so that's what Gabriel had come from. You know, these months earlier, he says, okay, this time I'm going to try not to be so scary. That's what I'm picturing. And so here Gabriel comes to Mary, and I have a picture. Oh, that too, right? That's the title. I have a picture. And we think Mary always had this halo around her and everything's calm, cool, and collected, silent night, holy night, calm and bright. This was a scary conversation. And uh, she was startled too. Look what it says. He's trying to be calm. Greetings. You're highly favored. The Lord is with you. Verse 29, look at her response. Mary was greatly troubled. She was freaked out. Not only at the angel's appearance, and I don't know about you, uh, I think I'd be freaked out if an angel showed up. And this isn't the kind of angel that shows up like you're in your dreams and you're kind of imagining this. No, this is broad daylight, walking, talking angel shows up. And he's saying these things. And it freaked her out. And it says she was greatly, tr not just troubled, this, this was like scary. This was a surprise. Not the fun kind of surprise. At his words, and wondered what in the world of the, what kind of greeting this may be. But the angel said to her, here's what they said every time, right? Chill out. <laughs> be not afraid. It says in most of our translations, in this one it says, do not be afraid. He did it again. He scared her, startled her. Mary, you have found favor with God. And he started trying to talk to her. This is a good thing. But then, look what he keeps on saying. Now, this is a lady who, in front of the whole community, and her family guarded her reputation. And he has this news. You will be with child. Hmm. And give birth to a son. And I think Mary's going, You got the wrong teenager here. He keeps on going. You're giving them the name Jesus. He will be great. He keeps on trying to soften the blow of this news. He will be great. And, and will be called the Son of the Most High. And Mary's going, What in the world are you talking about? The Lord will give him the throne of his father David, and he will, be, he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end, trying to soften this with her. But then all Mary can come up with in response, how? You know, she may be pure, but she's not naive. She knows how that works. How in the world is this going to happen? But think of the story the last time that, that Gabriel had this conversation with Zechariah. Remember? Well up in years, it says. He was a senior citizen. He and his wife had never had children. And when he told him he was going to have a son, he said, you got to be kidding. We're way too old for that. And Mary's position is exactly the opposite. You know, I don't know how this is going to happen. How will this be? It's right there in verse 36, 34. Mary asked the angel, Since I am a virgin, keeping myself pure. The angel answered, keeps on going. Verse 35. Can you imagine how far-fetched this sound? Oh, no problem, Mary. The Holy Spirit's going to do this. And she goes, oh, gotcha. Cool. No problem then. No, what? The angel said, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. I think she's saying, Yeah, he kind of already is. So the Holy One will be born, be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is the word that it uses there in my translation. Because of the age difference, I've always kind of wondered, 
if Elizabeth, Zechariah's wife, was not Mary's aunt, her tia, because of the age difference. But it just says relative, could have been a cousin, uh, but the, the word is not clear, but that's just what I surmise. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age. And the tra angel's trying to talk to her. Oh, no, this isn't far-fetched. <laughs> Elizabeth's going to have a baby. You can, too. And Mary's going, no, I can't either. And she was said to be barren in her... Uh, she who was said to be barren is in her sixth month. Promises being kept. Wow, well, seems far-fetched. And he makes a statement that finally calms us down a little bit, and I think it probably did her, her too, for nothing is impossible with God. And he goes and say, I'm the Lord's servant. And Mary's reply was really, really important. Think of the options that Mary had. No way, Jose. Not me. Not going to do this. I can't go there. This is too far-fetched. This is too scary. This isn't the plan we had. We have a real tidy plan, and that's not it. No, she says this. May it be. Wow. You know what? We've had some surprises this week, haven't we? May it be. Okay. All right. I'm going to go. I'll do it. I'm in. May it be. The catchy people had the coolest phrase when something like this would happen. And their word was this, Hokan Tashak. Let it be. That's how they ended their prayers. Hokan Tashak. Amen. Let it be. I think the Beatles wrote a song about that. Yeah. You realize how important a part of this story is? Let it be. And that we would all, this Christmas and all the rest of them, they will all have their versions of chaos and surprise and scariness and strained relationships. Okay, God, I'm going to trust you with this. Let it be. Let's keep going. I am the Lord's servant. May it be to me as you have said. Then the angel left. Well, the story doesn't finish there, but I'm thinking, can you imagine what's going on in Mary's mind? You know, one thing was startling enough that the angel shows up, and then what he says is totally weird, and she's freaked out, and then the angel leaves, and she's sitting there by herself. I have a picture for that. And she's going, wait a minute, what just happened? And she's sitting there all by herself. I said... Let it be. But this is going to be really complicated. And so, she does what I've seen my daughter do. And I hope you have somebody in your life like this. Mary had an aunt who was always a source of comfort for her. And so she said, I need some time with my aunt. And uh, her daughter Dana has her Aunt Janie. And how many times I've seen her call Aunt Janie and say, Hey, can you meet in for, for lunch in Canton? Dana lives in Dallas, and Janie lives in Tyler. They meet in Canton just to have supper or lunch together, just to get some aunt time in. It does her a lot of good. And she has another aunt who lives in Abilene. And she'll call up Aunt Dana. Say, Hey, Dana, I need some aunt time. Can I go and spend the night with y'all? And so, I'm so delighted that Dana has these two aunts in her life that she can go to when things aren't going the way that she had planned. There's some surprises. She's having to navigate this, trying to figure this out. But she, she goes to see her aunt. Let's go ahead and read that story at the time. Mary got up and got ready, and look what she did. She hurried. I've got to get some aunt time in. She to the hill country of, of Judea where she entered Zechariah's home, remember the priest, and uh, greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb. And you know how the story goes. Then Mary tells her the same things that Mary had already heard from Gabriel. And so Mary's going, how did you know? I think. 
but the affirmation, the confirmation that she got from this aunt. You know, she didn't hear it from Zechariah. Know why? Remember, he couldn't talk. <laughs> and so, finally, it gets calm in Mary's little heart because of this time with her aunt and she can calm back down and maybe her heart can catch up with what her head and her words had already said may it be maybe her heart was to the may it be stage so the story goes on and after this conversation and this visit then Mary sings so she goes from freaked out to really just caught up in the wonder of it all. And then we, we just read a part of her song. It starts at verse 46, and Mary said, My soul glorifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. This would have been a song that she's singing. From now on, all generations will call me blessed. And we do, don't we? For the mighty one has done great things for me. Holy is his name. And the song keeps on going. So Mary went from freaked out to finally singing. But the end of the story is not here yet. After Mary's song, guess what she has to do now? She has to go back and guess who she has to tell. Hey, uh, Joseph, did I, did I forget to mention to you? How do you think that's going to go? Well, we're going to find out next week. But this is a story that's full of surprises. It wasn't all calm and bright. It's tumultuous. Just like this Christmas is. In Del Rio and in our families. But you know what? The uh, promise is going to be kept. And we'll see that in the next few weeks. Let's pray together and then we'll have a time for invitation. If there's a part of this story that just really grabbed you and said, okay, let it be. Invitation is time that you can communicate that to all the rest of us. Have something to pray about? You know, we can do that too. I'll turn the mic off and we can visit together. Let's pray together and Dunamis Spirit will lead us in a time of invitation. Lord, we thank you that these stories that we thought were so familiar and we get to reading them, we slow down and read it enough times, then we start seeing the surprises. And then we start seeing ourselves in these stories. And we realize that the first Christmas is a whole lot like this Christmas. And there were scary parts to it. And there was confusion, but there was also comfort and there was also peace. And Lord, thank you that you invade our world with that kind of Christmas, the real Christmas. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.